Higher rates battle with inflation. The federal debt reaches for the stratosphere. Regional banks pull back from the precipice. Real estate values plummet. And breakthroughs in artificial intelligence may save us all or make it all worse. Welcome to a special year-end edition of Bloomberg Wall Street Week, bringing you some of the stories that define the year 2023 for Global Wall Street. The year that's just about to end did not lack for drama. From a tragic fire that wiped out an entire town in Maui, to Taylor Swift taking the entertainment world by storm with her Eras Tour. From the coronation of a new king of England to what seemed like an endless series of votes to select a speaker of the House of Representatives. But through it all, the story that most dominated the worlds of business and commerce was inflation and what the Fed was doing about it with historic rate hikes and all that aftermath for markets. So we start our review of the year with the Fed and the economy. In August, we talked at the Aspen Economic Strategy Group meetings with two regional Fed presidents, Austin Goolsby and Rafael Bostic, about how they saw the quest for a so-called soft landing, whether we could get inflation down without cratering the economy. Austin Goolsby of the Chicago Fed turned to the lessons of that monetary policy sage, Johnny Cash. We've much remarked on the stickiness and persistence of services inflation. But we knew that. That, that that's, not, that's not where we went wrong over at the end of last year, beginning of this year, w with inflation l lasting a little longer than we thought. It has been that goods prices, while down, have not gone all the way down to where they were before the pandemic. I feel like that's kind of started and that's put the Fed on this line. I mean, it's a thin line to walk, but getting the prices down without having a big recession, we're gonna Johnny Cash this thing <laughs> and, and walk that line. And that's for sure the goal. Uh, and goods prices gotta come down. And then the next one's gotta be housing. As you know, it's the, the housing that's in the CPI is based on a bunch of market rents and it takes a while to flow through. So hopefully as we go into the fall, that's, that's gonna be the next one. So I'm gonna stick with the Johnny Cash, yeah. walk in that line. Yeah. Okay. How long is the line? And we know that the target is 2%. Yeah, it doesn't right. feel like you're gonna come off that 2% goal, but how long till you get there? How patient can you be? We, we gotta be somewhat patient. You know, take as just a microcosm example, this thing with housing. We've seen the market rents coming down but it takes a while for that to flow through into the, let's call it the average housing prices that are in the CPI, and you just gotta be patient. I know everybody wants to say, ah, fine, Bob, we're done. That's, that's not how it works. If you walk the golden path and, and, and you walk that line, it's, it's gonna take a while. And the, rather than arguing about the peak rate of how many more rate increases do there need to be, what we should probably start thinking about is that, well, how long does this last that you're going to be at, at these elevated rates? It's been a 500 plus basis point increase over a relatively short period. If you hold at five and a quarter, five and a half, five and whatever, while inflation goes down, that is a restrictive environment. Yeah. Holding is, is increasing restrictiveness in, in that sense. Rafael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed didn't draw on country music in assessing the economy, but he did say it was a long process that would take time and that we shouldn't lose sight of how differently rural areas of his district were experiencing an economy that was booming in the big metropolitan areas. I'm not expecting this to be you know, a two month or a three month period. I, my outlook is that we'll still be in a restrictive territory well into 2024. Uh, and it'll just take a while for the inflationary pressures that we've seen over the, the last year and a half to fully dissipate and get us back to 2%. You'll need to see some more data before you come up with a position on where you should be headed in the future meetings. But what data points particularly will you be focused on? So I'm looking at really three things. The first is the actual inflation rate. So we gotta make sure that inflation is not moving away from target or even starting to stall. Uh, the second is the breadth of inflation. So in all of these indices, uh, you know, they, they track the prices for an, a, a number of different goods. At the height of the inflation uh, trouble, 
80% of the goods they tracked had inflation rates of 5% or more. Today, it's 28%, and, and this is in the CPI, and then in the ordinary times, it's 15 to 20. So if we can get back to that, that's a great thing. And then the third is expectations, because as you know, people make decisions based on what they expect things to be in the future. And if they start to expect that inflation is going to be different than our 2% target, and that's not what's happening now, then they're gonna make different decisions and our economic capacity will be lower and we definitely wanna make sure that doesn't happen. You talk about the breadth of the inflation. Let's talk about it breadth in a different sense. You are responsible for a, a good sized region of the country. There have to be variations within that region. I mean, you got Atlanta, you got Miami, you got a lot of rural areas. As you look at that region, where do you see the biggest variations that we should be paying attention to? Well, there are a good number of them. And you know, it's, it's funny that you, you say that because you know, my district is uh, all our parts of of six states in the southeastern United States, very large and very diverse. And right before the pandemic, we were using a theme, one district, many economies. And, and so when you look across the southeast, you have the big metros, Atlanta, Nashville, uh, Tampa. These places are, are growing fast, as there's a lot of pressure on housing as a result, but the trajectory there is very positive. You don't have to travel very far in the, in the district to notice also that there are places that aren't growing at all. A lot of rural places uh, are struggling. And as I've gone around the district, you know, I start to see these variations. And uh, you know, it's very, I've been talking to a lot of elected officials. And one of the things they're really concerned about is trying to broaden the geography of growth. That was Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby and Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic with their approaches to monetary policy. Coming up, we turn to the large and growing concern over the federal deficit and the risks it may pose for us all with former Treasury Secretaries Hank Paulson and Tim Geithner. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special year in review edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. When we weren't worrying about inflation and whether the cure could end up worse than the disease, many of us spent time this year worrying about that federal debt, reaching over $33 trillion, which is over 120% of GDP. Republicans claimed that it was the Democrats' fault and threatened to repeatedly shut down the government. Democrats claimed it was all because of the tax cut the Republicans insisted on. And as everyone talked over each other about the problem, no one seemed to do much about it. So we turn to two men who know the potential and the potential risks for the U.S. economy better than just about anyone. Hank Paulson, who served as Treasury Secretary under President George W. Bush during the great financial crisis, and his successor, Tim Geithner, who helped bring us out of that crisis based on the foundation that Hank had built. They reassured us that the economy remained strong, but they also warned that we couldn't go on forever without addressing that federal deficit. If you look at the economy today, it's a pretty resilient economy. You know, we've been through a lot of challenges and we look, we look pretty strong today in a relative sense, but we have a lot of long-term challenges and the fiscal challenges are part of those challenges. And, you know, if you think about all the things we face in this more dangerous world and, you know, a country with very high levels of poverty and huge challenges in innovation, uh, it's important to make sure that we have people focused on research that can help inform better public policy choices at the national level in these things. And that requires bringing people together from all sorts of disciplines, all parts of the economy, both parties, trying to figure out how to build trust and, and knowledge to help shape those outcomes. Hank, looking at the program, one of the issues that can be talked about is how much money we're spending, the deficit and the debt. That subject's been around for quite a while. You've dealt with it before. What are the prospects of actually coming up with solutions that might be implemented? Well, l let me tell you something. I'm an optimist. You need to be an optimist to do what we're doing. And I believe what we're doing here is a major step forward in doing this. Because if we can have great research and get people together across parties and come up with some terrific ideas and get the facts out and think tanks to both political parties, we can make progress. Now, you're right. Our, the trajectory, our fiscal trajectory is concerning. And, but we are a rich country and we've got time to deal with it. But we need to do some things in, in, in the next few years to, to change that trajectory. And uh, I think that's gonna be very important. And to do that, it's gonna take doing things on both the spending side and the revenue side. 
we're going to need more revenues and we're going to need to figure out how to to deal with some some difficult issues in areas like the entitlements. It strikes me that one of the things the two of you share, besides having been a Treasury Secretary, is being in Washington time where you had a pretty good sense of what needed to get done, but getting it done is harder than figuring out the answer. And I wonder if that might be true when it comes to debt and deficit, entitlements, taxes right now. Yeah, I mean, these long-term things that are very hard, you can't do with just one party. Yeah. You have to do them in a way that commands broader support across the political spectrum, and you have to build that. And you know, wh why why are people disappointed with outcomes from this political system? It's partly because people are uncertain about what works. They don't know how to think about the trade-offs. And so, by giving them a better basis of knowledge for making those trade-offs, thinking about the range of out outcomes solutions might work, you can improve the odds that we bend the bend the arc of governance closer to something that's competent. Hank, is that your experience? I mean, you'll come out of this uh, conference with some pretty serious papers, with some very specific proposals, some analyses. Is it your experience in Washington that somebody, even if they aren't the legislators themselves, their staffs, people in the executive branch will read those and be influenced by them? Yes, and we're, we're trying to keep the fires burning. We are not focused on the short term. Okay, we're focused on the longer term, but if we can, as Tim said, if we can put forward some good ideas, uh, show the trade-offs, put forward a range of alternatives, right? So w when we all talk, and we, we, we use Chatham House rules, very candid conversations, and when we get Democrats and Republicans together, there's really not that much difference between us, right? And that gives me hope. So again, the idea is to get the ideas out, get them out to both parties, get them out to the think tanks, and the time will come when things need to get done, and the sooner the better. No serious student of the problem of the federal debt thinks we can make progress without addressing so-called entitlements, like Social Security and Medicare. And so these topics were at the center of work done by the Aspen Economic Strategy Group this summer under the leadership of economist Melissa Carney of Maryland. She gave us the outlines of what serious economists are saying about the problems and what we should do about them. Our entitlement spending on Social Security and Medicare continues to take up a growing share of our federal spending. Mm -hmm. And there are good reasons why we have those programs, but we have in this volume, let's take up Social Security, for example. The Social Security Trust Fund is projected to run out in the not too distant future. And if we don't do anything about that, under current law, what that's going to mean is a 25% benefit cut for everybody. We need to get ahead of that problem. Mark Duggan in our volume proposes a series of incremental reforms to the financing and benefit structure of the program that would put Social Security on a sustainable fiscal path while preserving Social Security benefits for the non-wealthy Americans who rely on Social Security income. So there are smart ways to go about reforming Social Security. We just have to have the forward-looking leadership to implement them. You know, we also have a chapter by the economists Owen Zidar and Eric Zwick that point out many provisions that were implemented as part of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, those are about to expire. This is a great opportunity to take the lessons from the past five years. What did we see happen in response to those tax changes? Let's reform the business tax code going forward in ways that will raise business tax revenue without reducing business activity. And so, you know, all of these chapters make the point that it's not just about broad cuts in spending or broad increases in, in taxes. There are evidence-based bipartisan ways to both rein in spending and increase tax revenue that preserve benefits for the millions of Americans who rely on government programs, that preserve incentives for innovation and, and business investment and growth. That's what we should be doing. You know, our group, the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, we're surfacing these evidence-based, sound economic ideas. What we need is forward-looking federal political leadership to implement these ideas. That was Melissa Carney of Maryland, who is also director of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group. Coming up, dealing with the banking scare in March. Where did we go wrong and what did we do right? We hear from special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard, Bloomberg senior executive editor Stephanie Flanders, and former Federal Reserve Governor Daniel Tarullo.
That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is our year-end review on Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. The financial world was shaken to its core in March this year when there was a run on Silicon Valley Bank, followed in short order by First Republic and Signature Bank. Regulators stepped in and put things back together in reasonably short order. But the experience raised a host of questions about what went wrong and what needed to be done to fix it for the future. So Wall Street Week gathered a panel of experts to address those questions. Our special contributor, Larry Summers, Bloomberg's senior executive editor for economics and government, Stephanie Flanders, and Harvard's Dan Tarullo, who served on the board of the Federal Reserve during the great financial crisis and took point on bank regulation. It is important when we're thinking about what the implications are, you know, you have to distinguish what is an outlier about not just Silicon Valley Bank, but others that have got into trouble in this episode. What is fundamentally uh, a regulatory stupidity, you know, a very traditional problem, the interest rate risk that was just hiding in plain sight. Uh, and what is a genuinely new issue which was not being fully taken into account by anyone looking at the, the, the risks. And I think when, when you look at something like Silicon Valley Bank, you know, clearly it was an outlier in the speed with which deposits had been built up, in its massive exposure to unex uninsured deposits and reliance on that um, for funding. I hope it was an outlier in not having a chief risk officer for nine months, which was an extraordinary um, state of affairs. What was, but what was very traditional about this, and as, as the discussion with Larry and Dan is, is suggesting, was that you know right here was a massive interest rate risk that was whether or not it was in the stress test was something that central banks should have been thinking very hard about. And I think it was sort of striking that we had a lot of the debate around this. What are the hidden risks? You know, all the conversations that you will have had, David, when you ask regulators what's keeping you up at night, they would always talk about private equity. They'd talk about non-bank shadow banking has been the thing that people were, you know, was the, was this worry for all these years. And in fact, it was the most obvious problem sitting on bank balance sheets as a direct result of monetary policy actions by central banks that has actually caused this issue. I would just say, though, one of the reasons maybe they weren't looking at that so closely, although I'd be interested to know what Dan and, and Larry think about this, you know, there is an element of this which is new. And we see in the speed with which deposits left these institutions. And that's the, the non-stickiness of those deposits. And I think, you know, one of the things that regulators were thinking when they looked, considered interest rate risk potentially, was that there was a sort of um, self, a, a self hedging mechanism um, in a bank of the fact that deposits would be slow to move if they weren't being paid the higher interest rates. That is no longer the case. And I think that probably does have longer term implications for, for regulation and potentially longer term implications for how much we insure deposits. Yeah, I think that was a question for either Larry or Dan. Uh, does our entire approach to deposits change given what we've seen? The fact is they're not as sticky as we thought they were. I'd like right. to have a sense of exactly what the right. deposit profiles of this group of banks is as a whole, because in theory, at least, the supervisor should already have been distinguishing among different kinds of uninsured deposits, some of which yeah. I've always been understood to be eminently runnable, others of which have thought to uh, were thought to be at least somewhat stickier than uh, insured retail deposits. Right. If it turns out that those and this is what Stephanie, I think, was suggesting that those middle categories are uh, have changed then you're going to need a change in regulation and not just in supervision. I agree with what uh, Dan said, but I would put it uh, this way. We know that the Fed staff has a problem with discontinuous change. They basically entirely missed the discontinuous change in inflation because they stuck with their model and its traditions. And I think the broad concern that someone has to put is that for the first time ever, we are now in a world of highly digital banking with the ability to withdraw funds extremely quickly and with the ability to put them somewhere else extremely quickly and easily because of digital account opening. So we're in this super digital world and we're in a super digital world with 5% interest rates. 
And we've never been in a high interest rate, super digital world before. And large amounts of the economics of the banking industry rest on earning substantial interest premiums um, on uh, deposits. And whatever the traditional models are of what's sticky and what's not, the fact that we've had the world's fastest run and the world's biggest run at one of at the 16th largest bank in the country managed to have the biggest bank run in history has to teach us that there's a lot of reason to be open to a much wider range of possibilities about the risks associated with deposits uh, than uh, we thought previously. And so it seems to me that you asked me earlier what I would be thinking about if I was in the Treasury Department. And I guess I would be feeling my responsibility as the chair of the Financial Stability Oversight Council very strongly at a moment like this. And I'd be thinking about making sure that whatever I was saying and doing, I was adding to uh, confidence rather than uh, subtracting uh, from confidence in the very short run that if you're in an institution and that institution fails, it's going to be OK for you if that happens right now, because if you're not sending that signal in a reasonably clear way, you never know where the runs are going to start next. I'd be thinking about this issue that I just raised of uh, the new high interest rate digital world. And I'd be thinking about um, making sure that uh, there was some broader discussion of the whole official financial community about these questions of uh, stress testing. Because I must say, doing stress testing for 2022, even if it was started in 2021, without considering unusual increases in interest rates as a stressor is really very problematic. Uh, so I want to pick up on this, the speed of digital just for a moment. Uh, it's been talked about by others as well. Digital's not going away, at least <laughs> not that I can see. It's not going to, we can't, we can't uh, regulate digital out of existence. Are there other possible regulatory responses to that? I mean, we have circuit breakers when it comes to the stock market, right? If there's too much move too quickly. Stephan, I'll ask you the question. Is there a prospect of having something that's the equivalent of a circuit breaker for deposits? I think, I mean, I think there's a whole range of things we could get into. I think one could also think about, you know, the degree of, you know, how we look at liquidity ratios and liquidity buffers might have to change if, you know, there is that lack of, if there's lack of stickiness, if we think that those deposits could go much faster. You may even get, I mean, a number of people have drawn the conclusion, it's quite a leap from here, that this is one of the biggest arguments for having a central bank uh, digital currency, because then you can automatically Classically, have uh, a claim on on the central bank for your deposits, and you you, you 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 don't face any of these issues. It's a big leap from where we are now, and it means a fundamental change to to the model of banking that we've had. That was Larry Summers, Stephanie Flanders, and Dan Tarullo. Coming up, Bank of America has a special vantage point on the U.S. economy with its extensive retail deposits, its role in middle market banking, and its global reach. We'll get a sense of where things are headed in the new year from the top. Bank of America Chair and CEO Brian Moynihan. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special year-end edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. 2023 held some surprises for markets, with more rate hikes from the Fed, a stronger U.S. consumer, and a stronger equity market overall. All of these affected Bank of America's business in a host of ways. We sat with B of A Chair and CEO Brian Moynihan on his trading floor at the end of the year for a sense of where we've been and where we're going next year. Why don't we start with our core economics assumptions. The team, Candace and the team, have basically put out a new set yesterday. And so 
their view is the United States grows in the upper ones, uh, fourth quarter of next year to fourth quarter this year, 1.8, I think it is. Their view is that the soft landing is a little uh, stronger. In other words, that they have a 1% growth rate in the first three quarters of next year versus a half a percent. So it's a little stronger, 1%, a little bit plus. And all that means that the unemployment rate they also predict stays near four, doesn't get up into the four and a half range that they had before, four, four. So with all those projections we put them together it is a stronger economy for the United States. And then 24 mid to high ones, 25 then tips over and gets a little stronger. And the rest of the world, though, is next year they have it in sort of the high 2.8 percent GDP growth underneath the 3% target, and it moves that in 25. And that's really driven by China. They have slowing down. In India, they have slowing down a little bit just because of general demand patterns. What does that mean for Bank of America? Let's assume that all those economic assumptions prove to be true. What does that mean for your business? Well, if the economy is good, we're always going to be in pretty good shape. And then so we are out there driving organic growth. So we'll, we'll have you know, a million more consumers during the next year who open checking accounts with us or primary house account. We'll have many thousands of wealth management customers, many thousands of middle market customers. So it had, in the trading business, the team's done a good job and they'll keep driving that. So against the backdrop where you have you know, reasonably solid growth, I call it, and less risk of recession, the risk on trade will help the trading teams. But when you look across the core business, you know, the organic growth never stopped. Even during the pandemic, we were adding net new checking accounts. I think we're, this will be the 20th quarter in a row for net new checking account growth and things like that. So you're seeing that. The second thing is driving operating leverage. We've seen our expense base come from 16.2 to it'll be around 15.6 this quarter. That gives it, sets us up next year as the revenue from NII hits the trough and comes out. We'll make more money. Uh, credit's solid, and so we feel pretty good. But you're in this transition year. The whole industry is, whereas rates come down, um, some people think it's a good thing, some people think it's a bad thing, but the short-term cash that we're 350 billion of we carry on a given day that's just sitting at the Fed starts to lose as much yield and that, that's what we'll face a little bit. But on the good news is the longer-term stuff becomes much more uh, valuable. So that's a solid economic year perhaps we have in front of us in 2024. Uh, what about interest rates? We spent another year in 2023 just fascinated with the Fed. What is the Fed doing going up, going down? Are we going to get a year when we don't focus quite as much? How does it affect Bank of America interest rates? Well, the U.S. economy is this huge, diverse, huge economy. And the talk about the Fed really happens in periods of transition. And this is a period of transition. In other economies, the central bank has much more to do with the integration economy. Here, here it's, you know, at the end of the day, yes, they have a big balance sheet, but the balance sheet of all of us around it, a lot bigger. Yes, they drive activity through interest rates. Yes, but only really in transition time. So what they're, you know, what a good central bank team is trying to do is get to normalcy, right? Get the, you know, they've got inflation, price and they've got unemployment dual mandate, and they've got both in pretty good shape. And now they've got to sort of gl keep gliding into that. So I think the fascination with the Fed will ease as the, the, the rate curve gets a little more normal. It's very unusual to have an inverted rate curve, very unusual to have a 500 basis points increase almost instantaneously over 13 months in rates, very unusual to have all that happen. But now they've got to bring it back to normal. Meanwhile, those great companies we work with, the tens of thousands of middle market companies and millions and millions of small business, those are who drive the economy. And we, one of the things in the U.S. we get so fascinated with the rate structure, we forget that what's really going to happen is the people employ people, paying them, people are getting promoted, the people buying things. That's what really drives the economy. And the Fed's just trying to adjust at the margin to keep the thing in line. And that's, that's what they've done. So they've made their adjustments, and now they've got to normalize. And we believe they, that means they've got to bring rates down next year to, to ensure that they don't tip it into a recession. Back when rates were close to 0%, we used to talk about what that meant for your bottom line at Bank of America. You had a, an analysis of exactly how much uh, uh, 10 basis points would affect you. Right now, there's a debate among some people about whether we're going to end up at 3% or 4%. Uh, just taking those two numbers, how much of a difference does that make to Bank of America? So a, a change in the rate curve as of the end of last quarter, and it, it, with changes, we'd give this number every quarter, basically 100 basis points up or down is sort of $3 billion either way. Rates up, we earn more. Rates down, we earn a little less. And that's largely just the sheer rate curve dropping. But what's going to happen in this is the front end will come down and the long end won't move as much to get to more normal shape. So a, a big chunk of that is, is in the short end. But overcoming that, though, is, you know, so we're saying basically we're troughing out as we speak in net interest income. And then by the time you get to the middle of next year, it'll start growing. 
people forget as the rates are coming down, the economy grows, then loans will grow to overcome it. So we're start, you know, loan growth has been kind of bouncing around. Deposit growth this quarter is actually starting to pick back up. And so those are the two engines of the balance sheet. So if you have a deposit growing and your loan kicks back up, it makes up for that rate structure. But instantaneously, if it happened overnight, you do have a drag on earnings that is, you know, uh, uh, roughly think about is uh, for every half a percent, it's a billion bucks, billion and a half bucks. But the good news is around that, all that other activity takes place. Investment banking, we'd have a billion dollars core less revenue than we had uh, 12, 18 months ago. That kicks back up if people believe the economy's, you know, we're through the threat of recession. So that's the wonderful thing about this huge franchise is the businesses balance each other. And that's, that's what the nice thing is. One thing it looks like we're going to have in 2024 is new regulations involving capital for banks. Uh, and you've talked about that. Other banks have talked about that. Uh, how will that affect your business? I mean, we don't know what they're going to look like right now, but within a realistic bound, how's it going to affect your business? Well, just at a very really technical basis, we have about $194 billion of tangible common equity. If you take the broad assumptions that we gave people that our risk weighted assets, which is a denominator in the calculation, go up from 1.6 to 1.9 trillion, and our requirements 10%, at 194 billion over 1.9 trillion, we're at 10%. So we're fine, we have the capital today. That doesn't mean it, we believe it's the right thing to do for the economy and, and the industry at large, but we technically have the capital and we just would build a little buffer and go on from there. So it's not a big risk to us. That doesn't say do it then. That was Bank of America Chair and CEO Brian Moynihan. Coming up, going through a tough year for real estate with Blackstone CFO Michael Che and Kathy Marcus, co-CEO of real estate at Prudential. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special edition of Wall Street Week, looking back on 2023. I'm David Weston. This was a rough year for real estate as employers struggled to get workers back into the office and home buyers faced dramatic increases in mortgage rates. Real estate is the largest unit in Blackstone, and we talked with its CFO, Michael Che, about the challenges as well as some of the misconceptions. I think, you know, when you see the acronym CRE in a newspaper article, you can be sure it's probably going to portray the sector uh, and paint it with a broad brush. Uh, and the reality is, uh, you'd, uh, it's, the reality is uh, there's real bifurcation in terms of the dynamics in, the sec in, in real estate as an industry. It's a big industry. Um, you, you have one sector, the traditional office, uh, especially in the U.S., that really does have fundamental challenges and vacancy levels of 20 percent plus and so forth. That happens to be a very small portion of our portfolio, less than 2 percent of our global real estate equity portfolio. And then you have a number of sectors where, fortunately, we're concentrated through, I think, some good sector selection decisions like logistics, data centers, uh, a number of areas in rental housing, um, life sciences office, uh, where, where the fundamentals are really quite good vacancies in many of those uh, sectors are at 2 to 5 percent, which is almost at or ab just above the frictional level of vacancy. You know, market rents growing at double digits in a number of those sectors. So um, it really matters where you invest. Uh, and the portfolio construction I think our firm has created in real estate over the last decade are really, uh, you know, some of, our, some of our finest work as a firm. You've got a big company and you're buying and selling all the time, but there have been some recent reports of some selling in the real estate area, particularly some rare warehouses. If you look at your portfolio overall, would you say you're a net buyer right now or seller of real estate in total? I, you know, I, I went through in my litany of the deals we've done that, that to your point, the fact that even the last month we um, sold a big portfolio of logistics and we bought three others. Mm -hmm. By the way, $3 billion is in relation to having a portfolio that's, you know, $100 billion plus. So um, it's our business and given different strategies with different time horizons and, and sort of return targets to be in the business of buying and selling when it makes sense. Never forced to do it, but we can be opportunistic, again, both on the buying and selling side. And so I wouldn't say we're net buyers or sellers one way or the other. In addition to Michael Che of Blackstone, we talked with Kathy Marcus, co-CEO of Real Estate at Prudential, who explained the necessary transition real estate was going through in 2023. 
I think sellers are um, having a very tough time coming to term with the new prices and um, the, the gap between where buyers and sellers think things should trade um, and then overlay that with where the lenders may or may not be willing to lend. It's um, it, the, the, the transactions market is so muted right now. Um, I can't actually remember a time that it's been this muted before and um, it's only gotten worse since rates have spiked you know, really just recently. Well, if you have to refinance in this world, it's a very different world from just two or three years ago. Uh, to, at what point do a lot of the sellers have to refinance and it really has to change what's going on? Well, that will happen over time, and, and there are you know, uh, maturities that are coming up. There are maturities that have already occurred um, where there's been a bit of a kicking the can down the road, particularly in the office sector. So if you think about it, an office loan matures, and, and so what normally happens? Um, you could refinance that office asset, generally at the same or a higher loan balance, or you could sell the asset. Neither one of those things is really possible right now. The option that's available to people right now is to potentially extend the loan, um, and often that requires some sort of an equity pay down, which generally, particularly in the office space, is not that appealing to borrowers because in some cases they feel like they're um, throwing good money after bad. So that's office space. As you suggested, there are a lot of different parts that come under real estate and there's a big variety. Where are there some opportunities out there right now that you're interested in particularly within the broader real estate market? I'm really glad you mentioned that because um, it is definitely a common misconception that the office sector dominates the investable universe in real estate. And, and that's not the case. It's never been the case that it's dominated. It certainly has been higher than it is right now. But in the private markets, um, if allocations to office were in the high 40% range, um, they're now about 20%. And in the public markets, the percentage of the read index that is pure office is hovering somewhere around 5%. So it is far less of a sort of 800 pound gorilla than it was at one point. But I do think that gets a little bit overblown. In terms of where we see opportunity right now, the operative term is necessity. Um, things like housing, things like grocery anchored retail, things like infill logistics. So the basic necessities of life, we call them sort of necessity retail, necessity properties. It's food, shelter, and your Amazon deliveries, right? The things that nobody can live without. That was Kathy Marcus of Prudential. Coming up, for many, it was the buzzword of the year. Generative AI was all the rage, particularly after ChatGPT came on the scene. We talked with two experts, Marty Chavez of Sixth Street Partners and Nobel Prize winner in economics, Michael Spence. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special year-end edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Global Wall Street, like much of the world, was captivated by the prospects for generative artificial intelligence, fed in no small part by the phenomenon of chat GPT. It drove investment, it drove stocks, and it sparked a good deal of debate about how good or bad it could be for us all. Marty Chavez of Sixth Street Partners has been working on integrating computers into Wall Street since he came out of Stanford with his PhD. So we asked him how different this new version of AI is from what we have seen before. I started working on Wall Street in 93. And in 93, when people like me showed up on Wall Street, I, I, I often got asked, could you help me figure out how to print this document or turn my <laughs> computer on and off, right? What is this, what is this uh, kind of quant math and software guy doing here? So it took a little while where we, people like me, could find the problems that we could actually solve that would help us make better markets for our clients and manage our risk more effectively. That's something we've been working on for a very long time, bringing math to Wall Street. And so I've had an opportunity to see many iterations of this movie. Of this movie. So initially, one of the things I might work on would be, we've got a complicated book of risk. How do we hedge it? We've got 
30 seconds to make a phone call and construct the first order hedge of the book. All right, so we do that, lots of math and software. We want to do it reliably. We don't want to make mistakes. We certainly don't want to hallucinate and get the wrong hedge and maybe make the risk position worse. And we got pretty good at that. But I remember thinking even then, okay, so now we're calculating this hedge and the person next to me is calling the exchange and saying, buy or sell that many futures. I remember thinking even as a kid, well, we could do that part too, but it took a long time. Eventually we got there, especially in equities, markets that were exchange traded where there was a lot of data, and we could close that loop. You could do some analysis, and then you could say, this is the trade we should do, and then you could have the computers just do that trade. And at the time that began, there was a lot of concerns. How could that go wrong? What if the computer puts in the wrong trade? And then the whole loop got faster and faster, and computers were putting in orders with a latency of sub one millisecond, much faster than a trader could ever operate. And then we actually had some, some train wrecks. Uh, there was a company, Night Trading, where the algos run amok and kept putting orders into the exchange. At, that were at the wrong price, and so all the orders got taken out on the other side, and they eroded their capital in 45 minutes, and then they were bankrupt. So some things have gone horribly wrong. We learn from those episodes. I'm in the camp that sees AI as essentially wonderful, but still more of the same. So more math, more analysis, things going faster and faster, and yet I think there are some principles that are stable in time. So here's one. I remember a town hall years ago where I was talking and I said there's really three strategies that I see when it comes to computers. Number one is you could be a person who tells the computers what to do. That's my strategy and it's working pretty well for me. It's not for everybody. Number two, you could collaborate effectively with the computers and the people who tell the computers what to do. And I recommend that to everybody. Everybody can embrace that strategy and use the computers to give yourself a force multiplier, leverage, a superpower, and then go on and do more interesting things that the computers can't do. And you always worry, well, maybe we won't be needed at all and the computers will take over. I've never seen that happen. The third strategy, which I have also seen, is stand in the way of progress, see if in the name of your job security you can stop the computers, and that is really dumb, and don't do that. And some people do do that. I think that that advice applies today. I think everybody needs to be looking at computers and generative AI and thinking, how can I use this to be more productive. So the way I would think about gen AI, generative AI is yes, there's some amazing things that could happen. There's some terrible things that we must work to mitigate and prevent. But the central case is that it makes us more productive. Marty Chavez views generative AI from the point of view of a technologist. Nobel Prize winner Michael Spence, on the other hand, is an economist who focuses on how much this new technology will augment what we do or replace it. We're in a period of um, uh, intense exploration and experimentation. So, you know, people often say, you know, that it's important to acknowledge, you know, real uncertainty <laughs> when you're in the early stages of this. And that's certainly characteristic of this. Having said that, James and I, my, our best guess is that generative AI is mainly, not exclusively, but mainly going to turn out to be, uh, you know, a, a powerful digital assistant. Um, it's There'll be elements of automation. I think the best way to, to explain this is with an example. So the, the large language models listening to cues from the environment, or, you know, can write the first draft of a doctor's report. For them, they, doctors spend an enormous amount of time. Many of them think of it as wasted time, but it's important writing up reports on what they've done with various patients or in a hospital context. Um, and that first draft, you know, it saves an awful lot of that time. That's automation. Okay, is the doctor going to hand in the first draft without checking it? No, right? And so the doctor's going to spend the twenty percent of the time that he that you know of the original forty percent to actually check it and have a report that he's, you know, confident in. 
And so when you stand back from it and, it's a, and define the task, not as writing the first draft, but creating the report, it's a human, um, the, a human digital machine collaboration. Um, and that, I think, is what we're going to see. These, these, these um, AIs are prediction machines, essentially. They're pretty powerful. They're, I mean, they're stunningly powerful, you know, because they, they now switch domains, which we've never seen before. It, they seem to have human-like characteristics, the, the ability to switch from, you know, digital automation to the Italian Renaissance to writing computer code and so on. That's just, just completely new. Um, but, so we think we're going to see machine collaboration, human collaboration, and that will be the, dom the dominant model. There'll be some automation, and in some sectors there may, there may be some job loss as well. And there'll certainly be job change. And one of the points you make in the paper is that, as I say, this is not predestined. To some extent, how this ends up depends upon us and what we decide to do about right. it. Uh, explain yep. to us about what you think needs to be done or should be done so that we get the most good out of generative AI. And as a subpoint, how much of that can be trusted to the markets as opposed to governments? So, you know, I think the markets and government and attitudes and what and biases, you know, are all part of the mix. So. I think the first order of business is to is to avoid what Eric Bernelson calls the, the, in a, an influential paper, um, the, the Turing trap. So Alan Turing proposed that we evaluate <clears throat> progress with digital machines by using the following test. Can we build a machine that interacts with a human and the human thinks that it's interacting with another human? It's a fairly small step. Um, and this is common in the AI world, to evaluate progress in AI by determining how well machines do relative to human performance. So they, we do that in language recognition, we do it in image recognition, which is a huge breakthrough in the, you know, in the last six, seven years. Um, <clears throat> and we do it you know, with the generative AI. Does the generative AI do better than the average human on the LSAT, the law school aptitude test? Um, that's okay. But there's a very small step from that to thinking that, you know, well, once the machine passes the human, why don't we get rid of the human? Um, and that leads you to what you might call the automation bias. And that I think we do have to resist. And that that's not government, that's not business, that's not any particular sector, it's just the way we think about it. So I think that's step one. Um, step two is, you know, you can, influence the direction of technology and, and, and development. And I think, you know, with incentives and so on, and it should be influenced in the direction of uh, collaboration and, and augmentation is, is the term that tends to be used in this world. And then third, um, you know, I think we do not want, or did, with the way James and I thought of it, we don't want to repeat um, that pattern of, you know, sort of high high adoption rates um, and, and very low adoption rates that we saw in earlier rounds of digital, uh, you know, adoption. And so there, there I think the government has a, a very distinct role to, you know, in the, to at least think carefully about programs and, and, and activities that, you know, increase the likelihood of, of diffusion across the entire economy to small and medium sized businesses. And for me as an economist, this is not, in, not a, just a nice to have or a distributional issue. If, if we believe there's a potential productivity surge if for the entire economy, we're not going to get it, you know, if we can count on the fingers of one hand the, the sectors that have moved ahead in using this. So, so, so I think you, it's important from a, a kind of macroeconomic performance uh, point of view to, to, to think carefully about what we can do um, um, to, to maximize this sort of accelerate the diffusion and adoption rates across the economy. That was Nobel Prize winner in economics, Michael Spence. That does it for this year-end review on Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, this is Bloomberg. See you next week.